like to bring in another one of our amazing back-end techs, Commerce Tools. So they're a leading digital commerce platform that allow you to create powerful, highly customized commerce experiences. So with these experiences, they're building a profitable, sustainable brand, and their mission is to essentially disrupt the digital commerce industry. They're challenging and changing the world of enterprise commerce software by enabling their brands to cross the commerce possibilities chasm. So every new communications channel becomes this commerce possibility from in-car, video content and AR, voice and lot enabled machines to the devices of the future that we can only now just imagine. So they're responsible for establishing commerce tools in the ANZ region. Josh is dedicated to client services. He leaves no stone unturned and is responding to a brief just to ensure business objectives are exceeded and new technologies and practices are included from day one. I do want to introduce him as the Territory Director at Commerce Tools, Josh Emblin. He's also passionate about delivering a quality product that meets the needs of all the project's stakeholders. And I guess his long-term goals are to grow a team of passionate people who are committed to exceeding business objectives and just growing the Australian and New Zealand digital retail industry in the right direction. Today with Commerce Tools, what does the future of digital commerce look like? Take this journey with Josh and Commerce Tools through the evolution of commerce from the 90s, where legacy commerce platforms dominated, to the 2000s, where we see that rise of APIs and headless commerce. And of course, towards the future, where composable commerce will allow businesses to unlock the fullest potential of digital commerce. Please join me in welcoming Josh Emblin from Commerce Tools. Raven, thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing introduction. Um, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Todd. Uh, you know, really excellent introduction to the world of composable commerce, what it looks like, what it means for merchants, and what the benefits are for you. Uh, as Raven mentioned, I really want to take us on a journey today and look at where e-commerce started, uh, some of the trends that we've seen, some of the platforms that have evolved along the way, and so sort of what that means for the future of commerce and how we're going to build out world-class digital experiences using a composable architecture and that approach. So what I'll be covering today, we'll take a quick look at the first wave of commerce and what that meant when we all first started shopping online back in the 90s. I'll then look at Web 2.0 and when we went from being read-only to interactive, we could actually post comments and user-generated content, social media, um, and how RESTful APIs were really sort of powering uh, that change in the way we use the internet. I'll then look at the technology evolution and platform options, uh, what composable looks like, what monolithic platforms mean, benefits uh, of each, and then composable commerce, powering commerce everywhere. Um, I'll then touch on a little bit about sort of learn more and then by all means Q&A. Um, I'll probably touch on a fair bit of content today. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go. I'm sure Raven can get them to me at the end. But yeah, feel free and, uh, to ask questions and enjoy. So that first wave of the World Wide Web and, and e-commerce, and what did that look like? So in the 90s, the World Wide Web first became public. Netscape Navigator was the only way to really access that HTML and that hypertext markup language. And Java released JavaScript for the first time. Now, funnily enough, Mark Zuckerberg was still in primary school, as was I at the start of that era. Mobile phones were just getting mobile. If you remember the first ones, they were huge. They were probably 90% battery and only had 10 um, digits displayed on the screen. You were lucky enough to be able to call someone. And Amazon.com was first launched as a bookseller doing only $300,000 in revenue. Pretty crazy to think about where they started to where they are today. This is what e-commerce trailblazers looked like back in the 90s. I look at that Walmart site now and I just completely shudder and think, oh my, where do I even begin shopping? The navigation down the left-hand side, um, that background image you know, was there on repeat to try and increase page load speeds. And then I think for a lot of us, you know, our first foray into shopping online was really eBay started up as a consumer to consumer marketplace. Um, you could buy and sell almost anything that was legal back then on eBay. Um, and certainly, you know, huge catalog um, that was, you know, sort of hard to search, hard to navigate. But once you eventually found your product, you then had to work out escrow or how you paid people. Um, that sort of really led to the rise of PayPal uh, and some of the other payment methodologies that we take for granted today. 
E-commerce for brands and retailers, it was completely siloed. Typically, you had your warehouses, you had your stores, and all of that product, all that merchandising, all that marketing was done to drive customers into store, find products that they liked by walking around the aisles, take them to the checkout and point of sale, um, make that purchase, and off you went. E-commerce was a completely different domain of the organization that was run purely as selling online. And it was incredibly hard to do back then. There was a lot that went into getting your products online, merchandising them effectively, um, and then eventually allowing your customers to be able to purchase them and then finally getting them delivered, um, picked back and dispatched as individual items. It was a big change for retailers to be able to do that. And e-commerce was really an IT domain. It was the guys in gray suits. They were often in the basement. They were working with on-premise hardware. They were lengthy projects. Um, there were a lot of meetings that went into it. And then sort of very little actual coding was done. It was all about installing the software, getting it set up, getting it established, and getting it ready for your brand to then sell online. And the modern tech that we take for um, take for granted today really didn't exist. So ATG was invented in 1991, later acquired by Oracle. Uh, Intershop followed shortly after in 1992. Hybris was invented and first launched in 1997, later acquired by SAP. And IBM was also launched in 1998 with WebSphere Commerce. Amazing, still around today, still a lot of customers running uh, on ATG, sorry, on IBM. Uh, it was recently acquired by, by HCL and modernized and moved to the cloud. So what did Web 2.0 and the rise of social media look like and what did that mean for commerce experiences? Transformative 2000s and the advent of RESTful APIs uh, really meant that it was easy for platforms to be able to start integrating, sending um, rich content and information over the web and over those APIs. Uh, see here in that photo, that's Mark Zuckerberg there in his early days at Harvard when he came up with Facebook. Uh, that sort of really changed the way that we use the internet, uh, user-generated content, being able to log in across multiple systems and platforms, and then really sort of the rise of, of social shopping, um, digital marketing, and allowing brands and retailers to be able to create vast audiences uh, on the web to then push their products and ultimately drive them through to their brand sites. And a lot of what we know today was born, and it was fun building this slide because a lot of these logos have changed so much um, since these businesses were first launched. But Google was launched in 2000, followed by MySpace, Napster, uh, iTunes, WordPress, YouTube, you know, still around, still a big part um, of the web ecosystem. And then later on, some of those um, social networks that we take advantage of and take for granted today, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Pinterest, huge parts um, of how we shop and how we um, influence people online and their shopping behavior. So from an e-commerce perspective, others were born, others were acquired, and others were evolving. Um, Demandware was actually an iteration of Intershop that was taken and built to be a SaaS-delivered platform. Shopify was born in 2006. I love that logo of e-commerce made easy, and you know, all hats off to Shopify. Incredible what they've built um, as a business. You know, was started as just build your online store for anyone uh, to now be doing enterprise commerce globally. As Scott touched on in his presentation, Magento was first born as open source commerce back in 2008. Uh, and Big Commerce, the first iteration of that platform, launched in 2009 as well. So what does this evolution look like and what does it mean? And what are some of the platforms that we, we see today and some of these options that we, that we look at? So, the advent of cloud computing and that becoming public in 2009, 2010, really unleashed new technology for developers. And we see the rise of cloud native platforms, not just deploying somebody else's code into somebody else's cloud that you're then responsible for managing. You're actually taking advantage of a lot of those cloud native technologies that the likes of Google Cloud and AWS make um, available within their cloud networks to then build these world-class experiences and world-class platforms such as commerce tools on top of that cloud technology. So the likes of NoSQL, microservices, headless, GraphQL, uh, event-based architectures, front-end as a service, um, all of these things were built and evolved throughout um, that last decade. And a great line there, you know, AWS revenue is a proxy for cloud maturity. So what started out within Amazon as a way of them using um, 
bandwidth that they had sitting idle that they were, um, wasn't being used to power Amazon.com, they said, hang on a second, we can rent this to people uh, while we're not using it. Then they worked out how wildly successful and also wildly profitable that was and said, wow, there's a whole other business here. Let's go and build AWS. Let's go and buy a whole bunch of servers, uh, build those data centers. And then, yeah, a whole new business was spun off from the original Amazon.com. So what did the commerce platform evolution look like? And if I had to sum this up on a slide and talking from you know, 1990 and 2000, it was really about that commerce-led approach. You were selling online. It was a single monolithic application where the front end, the commerce, business intelligence, all of your content, all your marketing, all your merchandising was tightly wrapped up in that single platform. Again, you know, very sort of lengthy, heavy projects. You got them live and everyone sort of breathed a sigh of relief and wiped the sweat off and went, thank God that's done. We don't have to touch that again. Um, give it five years or so, marketing came along in 2000s and said, no, we need this rich content. We want to be able to engage with our consumers and our customers. Um, and commerce platforms had to evolve and say, right, we need to put these digital experience platforms um, in front of commerce, make it easy for marketers and merchandisers to get the right product in front of the customer at the right time. This was the rise of Adobe Experience Manager and platforms like Fatwire that started getting bolted on to these, these commerce applications. And that was, again, Magento, SAP Hybris and Salesforce Commerce Cloud really sort of evolved the monolith um, to be much more experiential for consumers. Fast forward another five or 10 years in 2010, the likes of Elastic Path, they realized that that commerce experience, the rise of React, Angular, um, these new front end technologies and headless were becoming really, really important to the consumer um, to give a lot of that, that speed to market and the flexibility that Todd and Scott touched on uh, earlier today. What that meant for the commerce platforms was that they then had to expose all of their functionality via APIs and build out those layers on top of the monolith to easily expose that to these new heads so that um, teams could work within that front end framework and really get that right. Businesses saw that and said, that's awesome, that's great. You know, you're working towards that, but really what we wanna be doing is getting credible speed to market. We wanna be able to launch uh, new business initiatives within weeks and we really need, you know, the ultimate in flexibility and to decouple all of these parts of the platform. And then hence Composable was born where you can come along with a custom UX, front end as a service there's a number of front end as a service and headless cms platforms speaking later on today that i'm sure will sort of deep dive into what this custom ux and what this layer looks like but really it was about composing best of breed solutions that meet the needs of your business instead of having to shoehorn you into the functionality that the commerce platform offers as out of the box it's all about saying no i want to pick and choose best of breed that suits my needs and I'm comfortable managing all of that because I've got strong RESTful APIs, I've got API gateways that can help manage all of this. And I really wanna be able to move fast and keep up with the market. So what are the options and what does this look like? And we take a look at you know, boxed versus built and all-in-one solutions or monoliths or suites, they're great. They've got many features out of the box. It's a less complex implementation. You're only installing that one piece of software. There might be a few apps or cartridges or um, extensions that you install in that platform, but really you can get up and running pretty quickly with that all-in-one solution. The limitations are when you then start to customize, any code change needs to be acknowledged across every part of the business from the database all the way through to the front end, uh, which means that you're often doing lengthy release cycles, a lot of um, testing on each of those. And it's not really meant for complex businesses. Great for someone who just wants to get up and running and, and stick with what they've got. The flip side of that is to go completely custom built. And if you look at people like Walmart, um, you know, from where they, they started back in the 90s, you know, they're now fully custom built. No platform out there on the market can really meet the needs of what they're trying to do because of that complexity. Um, so they've got the most flexibility, no limitations in taking that approach. But what it means, it's a multi-year program for implementation, you know, incredibly large dev teams. You need a lot of product owners and a lot of people who are contributing to that roadmap. And it's going to have the highest total cost of ownership. Um, but when you're driving you know, tens of billions of dollars in revenue, you can kind of sort of weigh that out. Where Composable sits is right in the middle of those two things. A lot of the platforms um, that make up your typical commerce stack will give you 80 to 90% of the functionality that you're looking for out of the box 
within each of those platforms. It's incredibly flexible. These platforms are meant to be customized. Taking that microservices approach means that you're only tweaking those little areas that you're looking for without having to take down the entire platform. When you're doing a release, it's drastically lower than the cost of doing that custom build. And you don't have to worry about upgrades because a lot of these composable platforms are taking advantage of that cloud native technology. So best of breed versus suite. I really like this slide and it really sort of sums it up. You know, if you want to go down that all in one suite platform, there's your pizza. Someone else has made it. It's got all the toppings. It's got all the things you want on it. It arrives in the box. You take it out. There's your pizza. Away you go. On the other side of things, going best of breed means you get to walk down the shelves, choose your best of breed components, pick and choose exactly what you want on your pizza. Make sure you get that flavor right. That's exactly right for you and also right for your business. Um, and ultimately, you know, have the flexibility and the innovation to do whatever you need to do to drive your organization forwards. So how does composable power commerce everywhere? And this is a great stat from Gartner at by 2023. And I first read that and you think, oh, gee, 2023, you know, it's a fair way away. And you actually, that's next year. Um, Gartner predicts that organizations that have adopted a composable commerce approach will outpace competition by 80% in the speed of new feature implementation. So a lot of what Todd and Scott have touched on earlier today, a lot of what drives commerce tools as an organization and what we're looking to you know, offer to our customers, part of the platform is really give you that speed to market, that flexibility and work within um, modern technologies that allow you to adopt new features, to keep up with customer demands and customer expectations and ensure that you're outpacing the competition and staying ahead of your competitors you know, by evolving that customer experience and being able to release new features within weeks instead of months um, and not having a lengthy backlog of things that you're looking to deliver for your customers. So omnichannel and commerce anywhere. Um, over the last 15 years of my career in commerce, we've gone from siloed to multi-channel, omni-channel. We're now talking commerce anywhere. And since joining Commerce Tools two years ago, it's been incredible to see some of the use cases that we are powering. Uh, Raven touched on it uh, in the introduction around Audi and being able to make purchases from within the vehicle, within the app. Um, but, you know, he, here's Todd. He's really at the center of it. And you know, he's shopping across so many different devices. He's finding his products across so many different channels. He's having them delivered to him in so many different ways. And without taking a composable approach, without having a lot of those you know, API-based platforms, you're simply not going to be able to turn a lot of these experiences on quickly and easily. And you're going to be left wrangling the monolithic application that you've got. And the C-suite is going to be saying, you know, why is this taking so long? Why is it so expensive? Um, we need to be able to turn this on because our competitors are already doing it. Great quote here from Rupert Murdoch. You know, the world is changing very fast. Big will not beat small anymore and it will be the fast beating the slow. And I think that really sums up, you know, why composable, why take advantage of all those you know, cloud native technologies that allow you to pick and choose best of breed, only consume the functionality that you need to build out what you're looking to sell online and really be able to evolve the fastest, uh, meet those changing consumer needs and get to market before your competitors can. So what does Composable Commerce do in terms of innovation? And, you know, we talked about this um, commerce capabilities and, you know, crossing that chasm uh, and what it means to breed innovation within your organization. The left-hand side here, we've got large marketplaces, digitally native vertical brands. They're able to do releases almost every minute of the day when you've got lots of different teams working within their own microservices. They can easily affect change within the organization by releasing that code without anyone else even knowing that it's been done. There's no downtime. It's not even considered an upgrade. It is simply a release to the platform. If you're not taking that approach, where we see a lot of legacy retailers and brands who are stuck in that monolithic um, architecture or environment, they're defining their roadmap, they're taking on you know, feature requests from all different parts of the business. They then have to prioritize, what can we afford to do? What can we actually get done in that quarter? Build it, test it, regression test it, release it, hope nothing else breaks once you move into production and then start that whole cycle again. 
So really slowing down innovation, working in that environment. And what we want to do is see our customers have the ability to quickly and easily affect change while working in that composable fashion. And what does a composable commerce architecture typically look like? I'm sure we've seen a few architecture stacks already. There's going to be many more uh, throughout the process, but a composable commerce architecture is really about taking your business capabilities, whether that's across content, payments, order management, those marketing and comms tools, data and analytics, um, identity management, search and merch, PIM, promotions, uh, your tax and fraud prevention, and a lot of your customer relationship and customer data platforms as well. Every business is going to need a combination of these business capabilities in order to power um, any e-commerce solution. A whole bunch of others there that I won't go into around point of sale and marketplace and localization and things like that. But they're typically delivered um, by a suite of applications that you have running within the business. Where Commerce Tools sits and a lot of other platforms, you know, working within the Mark Alliance and working towards this composable um, architecture approach is that omni-channel commerce layer. And we really become the brains pulling all of those business capabilities up into the web, up into that commerce application, and then exposing that through that API management gateway, which then gives you the flexibility to have as many different front ends as you want running on top of that application, whether they're social networks, whether they're Google Shopping and search feeds, um, a lot of your own experiences, web, mobile, in-store, wearables, uh, even Amazon going as far as having your know, tied buttons push that or reorder for you. And what this does is it then sets you up for any future application, device, shopping channel that you want to turn on, you want to expose. You've already got all of that API management. You've already exposed all of those commerce, sorry, those um, business capabilities via APIs. So you can quickly and easily integrate into these new technologies. And what you're really doing here is future-proofing yourself and your organization. Some of those composable commerce applications, I know there's a lot of logos on this slide, don't get scared. You don't need to buy every single one of these in order to turn these on. What this slide is really showing you what I want to talk about here is the flexibility of these Mark solutions and being giving you the ability to pick and choose the best of breed that you need to make up these solutions. So looking at the front end, looking at those experience layers, if you want to continue using the CMS or DXP that you've got, products like Bloomreach, products like Sitecore, um, you know, continue using those. And it's really easy to then breathe commerce capabilities into those in a headless environment. You can then go and choose front end as a service, the likes of View Storefront, the likes of Frontastic, the likes of Dady, Fantastic, cloud native hosted solutions um, to quickly and easily bring those, those rich commerce experiences to life. Or if you want to go fully custom, you think my business is so unique, none of these platforms are right for me. You've got the likes of Vue, Angular, and React, really modern frameworks to go out there and build the experience that you want your brand to have. From an API management perspective, choose your flavor, choose your cloud, uh, AWS, GCP, you know, we've all got great pieces of technology on offer. Um, some of the more legacy ones like Tipco Cloud, MuleSoft, Dell Boomi all great at managing all those different APIs and really sort of plumbing together all those different platforms and applications that make up your composable commerce experience. And then again, you know, looking at all of those um, commerce capabilities and those business capabilities that you need within your organization, um, an absolute plethora um, to choose from there and really looking at exactly what does my business need? What are my specific requirements? Go and buy just the functionality that you need from the vendor that you think is gonna work best within your organization. That was pretty quick. Uh, hopefully <laughs> that raised a few questions, uh, got the thought processes happening. Um, before we jump into q and I I thought I would touch on uh, learning more. Raven, if you can just go back to the slides for me. Um, I promise this isn't a sales pitch, but just want to sort of wrap up on commerce tools and why Forrester, Gartner and IDC have recognized us as a leader in commerce platforms. Um, everything we offer is individually consumable and can be priced on demand, uh, depending on the functionality and the microservices that you want to consume from commerce tools. We are truly cloud native, so leveraging all of that great cloud functionality from our partners, GCP and AWS. We are completely headless. We actually invented the term headless. Our CEO and founder, um, Dirk Horig, doesn't really like the term headless. He was like, no, it doesn't make any sense, but here it is, it's now ubiquitous. Um, we deliver hundreds of releases a year 
and they're all backwards compatible over our APIs. So any changes that we make guaranteed non-breaking, you don't have to worry about it when we're making those releases. We're programming language agnostic. You don't need to go and learn the entire stack. You don't need to have three to five years or be a senior commerce tools developer to get working with the platform because it all is delivered over those APIs. We're microservices backed. We are multi-tenant, which gives us incredible scale. And we are API first and API only. So every piece of functionality that we build and deliver for the platform, we actually write the API and write the documentation for that first uh, before we then deliver that functionality. So 100% coverage, RESTful APIs, as well as GraphQL. If you're into your podcasts, a great series with our Chief Product Officer, Kelly Gotch, and our CEO and founder, Dirk Horrig. They really dig into the world of tech entrepreneurs and e-commerce veterans, uh, looking at you know, global brands and retailers. They're incredibly open in terms of how they dissect the market. They get some incredible guests from across uh, the vendor landscape and also a lot of the retail landscape as well. Um, they're both seen as thought leaders in their own right and coming together, they get a really great group of guests on that podcast. So well worth checking out. As um, Todd and Scott talked about, um, the Muck Alliance, you know, feel free to join the movement. There's a lot of great content out there on the website. Uh, we have lots and lots of vendors joining. I think we're up to about 60 now. Um, SIs, um, Overdose One being Muck compliant, know how to architect, assemble, and manage a composable modern tech environment. There's also the enablers and those supporting technologies, the likes of hosting, uh, working within that environment. And then finally, ambassadors. We do have our first two ambassadors locally, which is really exciting um, to the guys from Officeworks and now Mac Alliance ambassadors. And finally, that is me. Any questions, comments? Raven, thank you. You're already seeing ideal or typical use cases for composable stacks. Well, um, gee, where do I even start with that? Great question. Um, so typical use cases for composable stacks, really for organizations who want to work on that front end experience layer, be able to make changes, deliver new um, front end frameworks to their customers sort of weekly or daily, if you like, without the need to even involve IT. So if you've got a head of product that's looking after just that commerce layer, sorry, just that, that front end experience and that shopping layer, um, front end developers can get in easily make changes without any um, impact on the APIs or the downstream applications. So really opening up um, what's possible in that area. Um, I touched briefly on Audi, but I'll talk a little bit about that case study. Um, you know, incredibly unique in what they've done in that you can purchase upgrades for your vehicle that can be then downloaded via one of the 47 SIM cards in the vehicle while you're driving along. So use case there is I live in the north of Germany. It's always cold. Um, I don't need air conditioning for the car. And then I say, okay, I'm going to go for a road trip. I want to drive down to the south of France in summer. It's going to be 35 degrees. I probably need that air conditioning. You can say to the car, hey, I want that air con that I didn't purchase in the dealership. Can I please have that for the next month? turn that on, you then rent that feature within the vehicle, you've got air conditioning for the next month, you enjoy your road trip, you come back to Germany where it's always cold and the air conditioning feature turns off. So yeah, lots of um, possibilities really working within that, that composable framework. Well, hopefully that was uh, insightful into uh, the evolution of commerce and where we're headed. Um, yeah, by all means, reach out, questions, comments, love to chat. Happy to talk about some of our customers operating here in Australia. Uh, we launched a data center just, done, just under two years ago when there were 20 customers in the APAC region. Um, and yeah, more than happy to talk to you about our work with Overdose and some of the experiences that they're building for our customers here in the region as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Josh from Commerce Tools, Josh Imblin.